So without further ado, why don't we kick things off? Ina Maria from Zendesk, I'll hand it over to you before we jump into our official panel for today. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Maggie. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Ina Marie Johnson. I am the Chief People and Chief Diversity Officer for Zendesk. And welcome and happy Women's History Month. And we are off and running. We've already had some fabulous events and this one will, I know, be the same. So thank you for taking time out. I know there's a lot going on, but this is really uh, an important topic for us. It's an important uh, moment to pause and celebrate and also learn and amplify some of the voices that you're going to hear. Um, I think we've all seen the research that says that COVID-19 um, was unique for women and it disproportionately impacted women. And for that reason, we need to be mindful of that. And we need to, again, as I said, you know, learn and figure out how we can support women. This has been top of mind for us at Zendesk. Um, our own Evangeline, who is going to be on the panel, who heads up all things global benefits and well-being for us and her team, they've given a lot of thought to how can we support uh, and what are the needs that not just our, our women have, but all of our employees around well-being. So you'll get a chance to hear some of that. And then Maggie Palmer, who is from Pep Talk Her, I love the name of your organization, is hailing, if you haven't figured it out with her lovely uh, voice, is hailing from Australia. And Maggie spent 15 years as a journalist and as a foreign correspondent in Europe, in Asia Pacific, uh, and also in the US. And she's worked with organizations like BBC World, CNBC, Vogue, and Marie Claire, which I love reading when I'm getting my nails done. That's it. Back in the days when we used to get our nails done, um, that was one of my guilty pleasures. Uh, but what I love is Pep Talk Her wants to really focus on things like gender pay and closing that gap, making sure that we have access to career talks, which is something we all benefit from, and then um, providing coaches. Mm -hmm. So it is great to partner with you, uh, Maggie. And at this point, I wanna let you do your thing and I'm looking forward to enjoying. So welcome again, everyone, and happy uh, Women's History Month. Thank you so much. It is a delight to be here. Thank you for your very kind introduction and a big hello. We've got hundreds of people in the call today. So hello. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to have this conversation today around the COVID consequences, um, particularly as they pertain to women today. I can see we've got a global audience. Thank you to everyone popping into the chat where they're joining us from today. A lot of people in the United States, but also I can see we've got Brazil, Europe, all around the world. Um, I actually live in New York City, but I'm joining you from Sydney, Australia today, uh, where I was originally from, uh, and I'm back to New York City next week, so I've been avoiding the snow. Um, so it is a delight to be with you today. My name is Maggie Palmer, uh, and I am the founder of Pep Talk Her. We are on a mission to close the gender pay gap and get company 50-50 men and women in leadership. So thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to join us today. A few quick housekeeping things. If you are joining the call, if I could just ask you to pop yourself on mute, that would be amazing. And if you've got questions for the panelists, please pop them in the chat and we will get to as many of them as we can. Now we have got an unbelievable panel with us here today. So I'm actually gonna hand it over to my panelists very quickly to give a tweet-sized introduction, uh, just to put you all on notice there. Um, Colleen, I'm gonna to go to you first. Um, I'd love you to just sort of explain to all of the amazing attendees today who you are and um, why you're excited to be having this conversation today. Colleen, I'll hand over to you from the Mom Project. Yes, hi, my name's Colleen Curtis, reporting to you live from Northern Michigan with all my pine paneling um, in my COVID limbo life. I am the Chief Community Officer at the Mom Project. Um, we are a digital talent marketplace for women and moms, caregivers, dads, allies to connect with the companies uh, that so desperately need their skills and experience. And um, I'm excited to be part of this panel because we celebrate women in the workforce, um, women at large every single day at the Mom Project. And so we are we are always thrilled to, to participate um, in any conversation that, that brings power to women um, living the life they choose. So thanks for having me. 
Well, it is, it is so delightful to have the Mum Project involved. And we're going to jump into the statistics um, and the research that you've done recently in just a second. Ginny, can you introduce yourself and your amazing experience to the community today? I'll try to make a tweet size. I got a lot of years, but um, so I'm, <laughs> I have my own talent and uh, leadership consulting business. I most recently was uh, a director at Google. I left there in November of last year where I led internal mobility, leadership, internal mobility, diversity, um, and non-tech recruiting. So my work has been as an executive recruiter for the last 25 years, and my focus is on career management. I wrote a book on career management. So the intersection of DEI, leadership, and career management, that's where I sit. Oh, well, it is a delight to have your expertise with us today. Thank you, Ginny. Mm-hmm. Someone else who's written a book as well, Ali, your book is out literally <laughs> any day. Thank you, Maggie. And also lovely to be here with Ginny again. We were on a panel a few weeks back and just great to see your face. Um, I'm Ali Kriegsman. I am an author. Uh, my book is called How to Build a Goddamn Empire, a very aggressive title, but it's really about the realities and underbelly of female entrepreneurship. It tracks my story building my technology business I'm a venture backed founder, um, but it also tracks the journeys of 30 other women building different companies of varying stages and sizes. Um, I felt like I was getting a very glamorized view and version of entrepreneurship on social media, on Instagram and the press. And Mm -hmm. I was really looking for a book that could handle hold me through building my company in a way that felt actually real and authentic and uh, addressed how stressful entrepreneurship really is. Um, I'm the co-founder of Bulletin, which is a wholesale marketplace. It's a tech platform that connects independent brands and retailers around the country that do business together. So retailers that are looking to stock their shelves with inventory from independent brands can come to Bulletin and discover 1,500 brands that are eager to expand their distribution. Thanks for yes. having me. Oh, thank you so much, Ali. And for any of you who may have been to New York over the past few years pre-COVID, you may have been familiar with, uh, with Ali's stores, um, Bulletin. They were quite famous quite throughout um, throughout New York City with a lot of feminist merch and other related items, which was always good fun. Uh, Always spent way too much money in your stores, Ali. So now we can spend money online with them instead. Great to have you here. And Evangeline from Zendesk, what a treat to have you joining us today. Um, You are passionate about, um, you know, workplace benefits and supporting everyone at work, in particular women. Can you give us your tweet size introduction before we jump into our discussion today? Yes, thank you, Maggie. Hi, everybody. I am Evangeline coming to you from Zendesk. I've been at Zendesk for a little over three years now. Uh, I am also wearing the hat of the global lead on our wonderful village employee community that represents the parents and caregiver uh, of our organization. And also, I am a mother of three daughters. So this topic is super, I'm just super passionate about it and excited to be here. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you so much, Evangeline. So we've got a lot to get through together today. We've got a little under an hour. If you have questions for our panelists, we are open book. So feel free to pop that into the chat and we will get to as many of those questions as possible. If you'd like your question to remain anonymous, just send it as a direct message to me, Meggie Palmer, and I will keep that anonymous for you. Colleen, I want to start today's conversation with you. Now, we've all been reading the statistics that say that women have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and that impact has been worse for women of colour. The Mum Project has done some bespoke research. I would love if you could tell our audience, what did your research find about COVID-19 and how it's affected your your community of of working mums? Yeah, so right around this time last year, um, we kicked off a survey that really um, looked at 1,500 working parents, predominantly moms, and kind of how work was changing with the pandemic. At that time, 46% of women were 46% more likely to be forced or or opting out of the workforce. Um, And so that was a pretty startling stat that we came to pretty early. I think we've seen the headlines follow that arc over the past year, um, specifically um, disproportionate burden to women of color. Um, We just redid, uh, we re-upped that survey. Actually, we haven't even published it yet, but I got the bullet points this morning so I could bring them. Um, That has jumped to 53%. So women now 53% more likely uh, to be opting out, um, even as we've kind of are hopefully coming to the the awakening and the the after of the pandemic. And so seeing a lot of um, just 
from the community that we serve moms, um, women of color, just really, um, a point of resilience fatigue. And we're, we're seeing that come through in, in both kind of quantitative and qualitative studies that we've done. Um, I think if there's any kind of interesting tidbits, we did a silver lining study um, that I, you know, I cling to, cause I'm like, what can we get out of this? What are the good, what are the, what can we bring forward? And 66% uh, of women uh, report being, uh, feeling much more confident about advocating for themselves at work and the flexibility and respect they need to be their best self at work. And so I think um, as we've, you know, continued to see a lot of these headlines and reports that have come out, uh, solidifying the story of, of really how moms and women have been the backstop in this pandemic to keep workplaces and families functioning. Um, we are seeing, I think, some some really great outcomes in terms of advocacy, um, respect for working parents, respect for, you know, mothers in the workplace. Um, so I'm hopeful that we we continue with some of that evolution and that, you know, if nothing else, the pandemic has accelerated adoption of um, what it means to support full people in the workplace. And I really th like the point that you made that, you know, there are some silver linings to the data that you found. And Ali's made a valid point in the chat that this idea of resilience fatigue is a real issue. And Evangeline, I want to come to you on that in just a moment, because I know that companies are trying to work out what can they do as businesses? What can you do as leaders to support your team through these just extraordinary times that we're going through. Just, just one thing, Colleen, quickly, I noticed that the data, um, there was a lot of negatives to come out of your research. And it did say that, you know, women were, you know, 46% more likely to leave the workplace than men, which is fairly startling. When we think about the progress that we've made over the past few decades in terms of working towards equality and equity in the workforce. Now, the UN women are saying that sadly, the past 12 months have certainly set us back. Um, which is problematic, and I want to I want to come to to um, Evangeline and Ginny on this. But but the other thing I think that is interesting that you found was that a lot of the mums, more than ninety percent from the data that I read, Colleen, um, of this new research, more than ninety percent of mums said that actually this work from home situation was a net positive. So I, I wonder, is that sustainable? Do we think that has everyone been given grace this year? Or do <laughs> Yeah. Yes. I think there has, I mean, this is like a year like no other. So there was no, there was no track for this. There's this huge asterisk of, yes, we all were campaigning for flexibility, respect, work from home. In some cases, remote work was the future. We didn't anticipate daycare, schools, e-learning, um, year-long shutdowns of the childcare industry. And so I think there's a big asterisk to that. I think 90% um, of women reporting, um, significant positive outcomes related to not commuting, business travel, no longer being expected to be at after hours, off hours work events, like really being able to do that. I think we saw that on the flip side, we also had um, some interesting breakdowns of how work was getting done, but if nothing else, we're seeing 90% reporting um, more autonomy, better productivity in some ways to get the work done in a way that they felt was most productive for them. So, um, so yeah. It's a bit of column A and a bit of column B. Evangeline, really interested to hear from you. And we're having quite a few people come through in the comments as well, asking this exact question. As managers, as leaders of businesses, what can companies do realistically to help support all parents um, and all people in the workforce, but particularly mums? Because we know that they've they've borne the brunt of a lot of the, the emotional the emotional labor and the the extra responsibilities as a result of COVID. What have you put in place at Zendesk to help support staff? Yeah, so I mean I speaking from Zendesk, we are super resilient. I mean, right on the heels of uh, the pandemic, uh, we we heard from our employees. That was the number one thing is we we listened to our employees. And there were so many channels in which our employees shared uh, where they needed support, you know, uh, and 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 we acted on that. Some of the things that we did at Zendesk is um, one of the first things we did was uh, put in uh, job protected caregiver leave. Um, and immediately, it was. I mean, everybody felt the shock of uh, of mixing uh, work and life um, as we as we juggled all those demands, and and, and folks just needed time the time to have the confidence that they can step away for a couple of weeks 
and then come back and feel supported. So that was extremely important to us. And we're actually still continuing that program. Um, uh, it would be a full year coming this September. So we're continuing because the global pandemic is still around. But also another one of the most important things that, um, you know, we put in, we put messages out into the organization. We empowered employees to share their thoughts. Our, um, coming just from our leadership team, our e-staff team, we even did a toolkit for parents and caregivers where they spoke on video encouraging um, employees that, hey, focus on the outcomes. It's not about how much time you're in front of your computer. Uh, when you do it, it's about how. And so that that is like changing the whole conversation around flexibility. I think, uh, I feel like the, the term work-life balance is like it's it's just like it's it's old now right it's all about integration so we're having those um conversations now we have a whole a team involved in you know how how do we evolve flexibility um and you know some of you said colleen like uh you know i've been advocating for myself for years and several jobs before like i need this flexibility to pick up my kids and all of that um <laughs> i needed to pick them up by five and sports and all of that so now it's actually to the forefront i think uh what used to be somewhat invisible in terms of um all the demands of work, uh, work and life is now coming to light to be more visible and now employers need to um you know really have flexibility as a talent strategy when keeping you know where parents women caregivers um and motivating them so that's some of the short things we did at Zendesk, but there's many, many more, but I'm not going to take. <laughs> I want, I don't know, Ginny uh, and Meg, I'll hand it over back to you. No, it's really interesting. I think that those are such important policies and it's, it's clear from the conversations we've had, Evangeline, that it's made a huge impact. I want to just understand, so it sounds like, you know, we hear stories of, you know, really impressive companies and employers of choice like Zendesk who've got these great policies in place. Ginny, I want to hear from you because, you know, you, you're, you've got decades of experience in executive recruiting. You, you know, were a big part of the recruiting team at Google for a very long time. What I want to know is, you know, there's these, there's these ideas that um, the policies are in place that should support women and that should be accepted. Do you find, though, that, um, that it, it, in practice for most companies, do they get the balance right? And are they able to actually support women? And do you think that we'll see this sort of support continue beyond, say, the next couple of months? What's, what's your instinct on this, Ginny? Um, my initial response is no, <laughs> they don't get it right. Um, you know, policies are only as good as the extent to which they're honored and enforced. Right. And so I think a lot of companies are are kind of loose and, and they empower their leaders to have a lot of discretion as to how they're going to lead and manage. And there's a big distinction between the two. Right. So I think um, when I think about what can leaders be doing, I actually think that leaders need to be taking very individual, personal, introspective journeys um, because people are looking to the policies but to the extent that the leader isn't actually modeling and owning and believing um, in equity, and that's part of what we're talking about, whether we're talking about women, other underrepresented individuals, um, then it's, it's not going to stick. And so these leaders really have to, I, you know, and they're for male or female, right? I'm, no one is exempt in all of this. The leadership cuts across all lines. Um, and so for men, I saw a note from, I think it was Gary in the chat, was asking about and he was referencing his daughter and so it's great that you have a daughter i'm i'm a daddy's girl um but i think sometimes that that sentiment about your daughter doesn't necessarily translate into um how you might be treating and addressing women in your organization um and there can be all these microaggressions there could be lots of other behaviors that really undercut her um ascension and recognition and contributions um in your organization so i think advocacy allyship, these are terms that get bandied about a lot. I think they hold great meaning, but I think it's at the individual leadership level that you need to come clean with yourself. Um, and if it means that you don't have people on your team who aren't living out those values, then you get rid of them. I draw a very hard line on that. I mean, it's, it becomes an issue of tolerance, right? You can have all the practices in place that you want, but there are no consequences. And if you don't hold people accountable for it, and then you know, then you're you're not living the vision and the values of the organization. 
It's such an interesting point, Ginny. Really appreciate that. And I think it's, you know, I think a lot of companies have those policies in place where there is an expectation that management will put in place and support those policies being taken up across the organisation. Um, and, you know, we have seen some really great policies come out of some employers of choice. As I say, Zendesk and others doing really great work during the pandemic. Ali and Colleen, want to hear from you. How important is allyship in this conversation? Because Gary's asked a really great question. You know, he wants to do his part and he just wants to know how can he help support. So, Colleen, from a research perspective, what did your data find? And then, Ali, interested to hear from you about, you know, your experience of working in, in professional corporate America before founding your business as well. What is the role of allies? Because I think, you know, this idea of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, I think a few of us were chatting offline before about there's a bit of frustration, right? Because it's great to have these conversations. It's so awesome that there is that day and that month every year where we are acknowledged and these conversations happen. But outside of this month, what can each of us do as individuals to help move that, move that needle? So, Colleen, research-wise, what did the Mom Project's data sort of show on this issue? I'm not sure we have one specifically on allyship. I will say from our um, work with, you know, customers and partners and then our community, I think what we're seeing is um, that allyship is a constant practice, right? And it's a, it's an intentional practice day over day, week over week, month over month, where we're evolving how we, how, how we can empower those around us to, to achieve what they would like to achieve. Right. And that, that takes a, a very open practice of, of being able to commit to that and that it's not a destination. And it's not something that we just do for a month or for that special day on March 8th, where all of a sudden everyone loves women for the day. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, we just do this every day. Like we need to be committing to the success of others if we're empowered to do so every single day. And so I don't have a stat or a good nugget on allyship. Um, it's something I think we should explore further, but I think um, what we've been trying to really press forward with those we work with is really that this is a, a commitment that requires each of us to get out of our comfort zones and be able to advocate for those who um, who can, often cannot advocate for themselves and be able to do that daily. Totally. Those courageous conversations. And I want to talk about that in a little bit. Ali, you mentioned earlier, you picked up on a point um, that I think Evangeline made earlier too, this idea of resilience fatigue. I wonder in terms of allyship and in terms of, you know, moving the needle for women's rights, do you feel some resilience fatigue in the work that you're doing? I, I genuinely feel like I don't have a right to claim that I have resilience fatigue. I manage two women that have children and I'm 29. I myself don't have children. And me and my business partner, Alana, as leaders have have always maintained a pretty small but very effective team. And in us building out our childcare policies and how we work with and accommodate uh, moms at our company, we didn't, just speaking about allyship, we didn't decide to just impose what we thought it should be. We, from the very beginning, brought them into the conversation. Um, so the women that actually have children on our team have been a part of setting the culture and the standard and the policies for their work life. Um, I'm about to promote a woman on our team that has four children. And we had a conversation yesterday about the opportunity. And instead of me asking, do you have the bandwidth for this? Like, can you make this work in, in a subtle way? Like, shaming her for having four kids, right? I just said, how can we structure this so that it works for you? What hours do you want to work? How can we accommodate your schedule? Like you are the perfect person to take on this new role at the company. And we want to make it work for you because you've shown that you can do this part-time while juggling four kids. And she responded to me and said, I'm a mom. I'm used to multitasking. I can do it all. Like, I think this notion of somehow like motherhood or accommodating women, I feel like especially at these big companies, these tech companies, it's almost seen like it's a, it's like a minus on your, on your like report card, because you're not available whenever the company wants, the company does have to do work to accommodate you. And it's seen as this inconvenience, but I see it as an opportunity to create a work environment for people that works and jives with their lives. So I don't really think about myself as having resilience fatigue, but I do think about the women on my team and what they're going through all, all the time. I can't imagine what it would be like as a leader to 
lead a department, run a team, and also be juggling childcare, a lack of, you know, having childcare, your parents getting COVID, like all of these things have happened on our team. And it, I, I will be totally honest with you. Like there is, when you're running a venture back business, there is pressure from the top down to not take advantage of your employees, but there is an inherent culture there of like, get the work done. Like we're getting grinded on by our investors. And there is this natural inclination to grind on your employees as a byproduct. But I think for Alana and I, we've really had to take a step back and say, okay, we're not going to let this top-down pressure affect how we treat our team. How do we protect them from this? And how do we create a culture where taking rest and building a schedule that works for you and accommodating the, these types of team members is something that people are really proud of and excited about rather than all of us feeling like, oh no, we're not all on Slack all the time. We're not always getting our work done. Like we have to wait three hours for this person to get back to us because she's going to pick up her kid. Like let's just, let's release that anxiety. But I do think a lot of it is about tempering that feeling from the top down or other stakeholders involved in your company so that you can lead with grace and, and lead the way that you actually want to. And with the values that you want um, your company to be known for, I think that's such a good point, Ali. And it was interesting, you mentioned your team member um, who has four children, who's an amazing multitasker. And I could see so many faces on the chat going, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Evangeline, I know you've got some amazing policies in place. You put in place job protected caregiver leave specifically and it's interesting because we're having a couple of people in the chat come through with questions about you know we, we need to support flexibility for everyone right now when they're working from home but particularly supporting career breaks for men and women and then that that return to work process how important do you think that is for you at Zendesk in terms of you know retaining your staff um, through those different life stages uh, it's super important. That's why we invest so much time in in developing our programs. And you know, it's it's a journey. I think you know we we introduce something, we test it out, we get feedback, and then we we reiterate. And so that's the the beauty of it, right? So um, I think it is super important why we we put in so much effort in thinking about our policies, understanding best practices, listening to our employees. We lean into each of our employee communities and we have several of them. I mentioned the village, which is our parents and caregivers group, but we have the women's group. We have uh, you know, a, a number of amounts of employee communities that we lean in to help us um, influence what we're doing uh, as far as designing our benefit programs. But it's a journey. It's uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna say we get it right at the very first try, but we try to evolve and reiterate um, uh, so that we can continue to improve. I think that's super important. I love how Ginny brought up earlier about, you know, us as leaders need to model that, right? So we also do a lot of socializing with uh, the leadership team to make things, to ensure um, uh, a lot of our programs will work uh, for our employees. But um, I mean, as we we're thinking, thinking about recruiting strategies, we're now in this new remote virtual first philosophy. I think it is super important to, to think about our programs and designing them to be flexible and supporting women, mothers, which, you know, we did, a um, we estimate about 40% of our organization being caregivers. So that is significant in terms of when we think about our strategies to recruit and not only retain our employees. So interesting. It's really interesting. Ginny, you've written a book um, and you've recruited thousands and thousands of people throughout throughout your very, very impressive career with executive, executive search firms, with Google, and now with your own um, fantastic consulting company. What's You've seen a lot. Like, what's your advice? Because there's a lot of people sending me private messages saying, like, I want to do something. How can I, how can I be more supportive? Like what, what, what's the, what's the secret sauce? Like what's the secret to all of this? Have you cracked it in your book and the work that you've done? I wish. Um, so, let, so let's talk about it because my book was really specific to the individual, right? Um, and I saw a question in the chat where a woman was asking about a gap in her work experience. Um, and, and I guess I'll start by saying, I wish as women, we weren't so darn hard on ourselves. You know, we, we have, we put all this pressure on ourselves. And very often I think, and, and you've, I've heard this and I'm sure everybody has that you know, if you see a job description, women think, gee, I need 100% of what those requirements are. And men are like, I'm gonna go with 50 and apply. And they get it. So I think um, we need to really just 
be thoughtful, take an inventory of what our competencies are. Maggie, you know that is one of my favorite words because I think competencies are quite different from experiences. Competencies are skills that you have developed either at work, right, or through life, um, and some are innate. And so I think that we need to really um, take an inventory and understand what our competencies are. And if you have taken a break, think about what competencies you were developing while you were on that break. You weren't sitting at home eating bonbons, you were caring for children or other family members or whatever other kinds of issues. And you might've been confronted with all kinds of things that you'd never encountered before. And you had to develop rigor and competency in that regard. So I think we need to, to really own our own narrative and do better about talking about ourselves and not shy away and be ashamed of this time. This is life. And we, you know, we should be proud of the fact that we can flex and do what we do at home and go into the office. To me, that gives us an enormous advantage. I was a single mom, right? Um, in fact, I, I, when I started as Spencer Stewart 20 something years ago, my son was one. My mother died a month later and I asked my ex-husband for, now ex-husband for a divorce six months after that. So, you know, we are more resilient. We are more resourceful and we need to own that because those are competencies that when you bring them into the workplace, an organization benefits. So get your story together, own it, be proud of it. Don't make any excuses and tell these people what you need in order to these people, meaning hiring managers and organizations, what you need to do your job well. Um, and when you start doing that, I think we're going to start seeing uh, a different a, a kind of a different dynamic because a lot of companies and, and managers and leaders are walking around going, what do I do? Look, I'm going to tell you what I need. And so get good at that because that's part of the solution. That's a really interesting point, just being really forthright with what your managers and what your business can do to help support you, you know, like not necessarily keeping it quiet having that courageous conversation, which I want to get to in a minute. I just, I want to just acknowledge your point, Ginny, where you said, you know, we need to stop putting so much pressure on ourselves and that this is life, you know, for better or worse, the last 12, 15 months and still, still it continues, right? It's been quite remarkable. Um, and, and I think sometimes we do put a lot of pressure on ourselves that we should be performing at a normal level. Um, Colleen, you know, I think one of the things that Ginny also talked about was the, the superpowers that actually you develop from time out of the workforce, um, particularly women, but men as well, when they're taking time out to care for children, care for family members, have a career break, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're um, working with the Mom Project, doing amazing work. You've got support from people like Serena Williams, very impressive work that you're doing. You know only too well about the fact that actually the women in your community do have these superpowers that do you think they're underestimated sometimes by employers? Oh, yes. I mean, all the way to bias against them, right? So we're seeing that, you know, women coming back to work from a career break or women who are parents coming to interview often do experience bias within that process that um, really does hold them back. And I, um, we did a study recently called the Why Moms Report. And really, it's to underline this, this really important piece. It's not just nice to hire and support moms. That's great, but it's a business imperative. This is a critical segment of the workforce. I, I even have to do this sometimes with my husband. He's like, it's so nice, that work you guys do. I'm like, no, 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 it's not just nice. It is important for the economy that women can participate in the labor force in a way that works for them. And so we find, we did a slew of studies, but the Why Moms report really indicated um, Teams with moms as managers report higher collaboration, higher productivity, better work-life integration. Um, see, mo uh, mom CEOs are indicated by the uh, workforce to care 81% uh, more about diversity and inclusion. Um, and so we're seeing some really significant business impact of um, psychological safety that moms and parents bring to the workforce. Uh, management, uh, that they bring management and collaboration. And it's really, if we're looking for ways that companies can innovate and drive business outcomes, you need to figure out where your parents are and how you're best getting them and keeping them. Um, and so if anything, I'd love to flip that conversation. It's like, then Zendesk obviously is an incredible partner of the mom project, but look at these companies who are are fully investing in this segment of the workforce, not as a nice to do or as a press opportunity, but as an understanding that this is a segment that we cannot afford to lose, or we will lose in our economy, in our companies, in our business outcomes. 
It's such an interesting point. Ali, I want to come to you on this because actually it's so true. Like, and also when we think about gender equality more broadly, and obviously at Pep Talk Her, that's our mission, is about getting more women in leadership. And it's just like sometimes it kind of blows my mind that we're still having these conversations about it's not just nice to hire mums, it's not just nice to have women on boards or women in the C-suite because the data shows us that when you've got women in the C-suite, you actually return a higher net profit. So do you know what I mean? It's kind of good for everyone, like shareholders. It's good for our 401k. So sometimes I'm kind of a bit confused. Ali, why are we still having this conversation? Why are we still having to like justify this? Do you know? Yeah. I mean, speaking from my experience in the venture capital world, meeting venture funds and venture partners and raising financing and even meeting executive recruiters. I mean, I... I think, to be honest, the the business world just defers to whatever they feel is safest. Um, and I think that was very much the case in 2020. Um, this isn't exactly in line with, with this conversation, but uh, last year, financing to female founders dropped significantly. Um, and even more than that, female founders that were able to raise initial small rounds of funding like pre-seed and seed, when it came to re-upping with additional investment dollars after hitting their revenue metrics or their growth metrics, uh, the slope literally goes like this. It's like after women raise their first round, the buy-in from investors decreases steadily over time, even if they are hitting their, their benchmarks. And I think there's a similarity here where whether it's in investing in women and giving them the money they need to succeed, whether it's hiring women and hiring mothers. But a lot of this data too is around bringing like black and Latino women into your company also increases revenue and also increases collaboration. But the thing is the people that hold the most power are still old white men and they defer to what feels safest. They defer to what feels most familiar. And that's why they're not giving checks to women. That's why they're not hiring these women. That's not why they're not promoting these women is because they see the mom thing as a distraction or they see the mom thing as, you know, them not being able to put in all the time that they can. They, for whatever reason, aren't interested in the diverse perspectives that women, you know, it, senior leaders can bring or black women can bring to the C-suite. Um, and I think a lot of it is just doing what they know and doing what feels the most secure. And I think it's really disappointing. And it's the thing that is crazy is like, sometimes what is known and what is secure isn't the most su successful or isn't the most revenue generating. Um, and we do have all of these statistics and all of this data, but I think it's con working with these companies and these leaders to take it from an intellectual understanding of seeing the numbers and seeing the yeah. statistics to an actual emotional and psychological shift. And I think that is where we're, we're not there yet. Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's such an interesting conversation, isn't it? And it's that, that idea that maybe during the fear factor of COVID, did we just sort of knee jerk back to what we used to know or back to the status quo. I think that's really, really interesting. I want to tackle this conversation from two points. I want to come to you, Evangeline, to talk, at it, talk about this from a, from a company perspective. A lot of people sending me some private messages. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. This is a fabulous um, debate, even in the chat, to keep up. It's wonderful. A lot of people here are saying, you know, um, what can companies do to put in place a structure so that there is um, a supportive environment, so that this idea of microaggressions or unconscious bias is kind of eradicated before it, before it becomes a problem. I'm, I'd love to know a little bit more about, you know, some of the policies that you've got in place. Like I know you've even done things like wellness days at Zendesk to give your staff just like headspace to sort of step away. Like how important is this from a company perspective? And then Ginny, I want to come to you for the individual because people are saying, you know, how do I advocate for myself in a way that is, you know, not going to leave me at a disadvantage? So I want to talk about this from a company team perspective with you, Evangeline, and then and then Ginny at the individual level. So I'll throw it, I'll throw it to you, Evangeline, to start with. Yeah, so I said this earlier, I think it's really important that it it's within the culture. And, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, echo it's echoed across just our executive staff and leadership team around just flexibility. And, you know, that's why we have a lot of these programs in place, because we feel supported. Um, so if you brought up the, the wellness days, you know, we've tested that throughout the pandemic, things like knowing that, you know, there was Zoom fatigue throughout the organization, we knew, um, a lot of uh, just 
many meetings and, and folks are struggling. We heard it. We put in a mental health platform actually so that employees, uh, you know, moms, caregivers, everybody can get really um, direct access to therapists and coaches because that was also just really emphasized um, in terms of needing additional support. But it really comes from the top. So we put breaks in the week. We tested it where we did something like Wellbeing Wednesdays, I think, or Flexi Fridays was another one. Um, and, you know, I, again, a, a one of our um, values is also empathy. So just that i think it's in the culture it, it really needs to be there and 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 within zendesk um you know we we echo that um in our all, all employee meetings and our materials all the toolkits we launch globally to all of our employees um but it's a journey like i said before we are active listeners and uh we we don't want to just um um you know talk we want to walk the talk but also constantly evolve and improve um and, and I mentioned this whole conversation around flexibility is a testament to that because we think that there's more work to do um, to support uh, women and mothers. And I just want to add one last thing. I think it's important for companies to, you know, uh, look into their data to make sure that the opportunities in terms of promotions um, and moving across the company is, is there. So, um, you know, proud to say at Zendesk, we do things like an annual pay equity analysis and make sure that, you know, we're promoting uh, women at the same rates uh, as men. So I think that all of that, again, coming across uh, the culture and our leadership team is I yep. think what makes this more successful, but it is a journey. Definitely. I think you raised a really, really valid point there. And Evangeline, some people would love to know, I'll get you to pop in the chat the programs that you have put in place to help support your staff um, more, more broadly as well. And it's, you know, it's interesting. I know that Ali, for example, who's on this panel also uses Zendesk, which is just a lovely synergy as well. But we would love to hear from all of you. What programs have your company put in place? And indeed, what programs are you using as an individual? Have you used Calm, the last, the Calm app? I've been doing the New York Times crossword every night, the mini one. That just helps me de-stress. I'm not very good at crosswords, but if I can do it, you can too. Um, but Ginny, you know, there's another really interesting question here. There's two questions that I want to put to you. And one of them is, you know, um, how can people who don't have children of their own support their colleagues in a way that feels genuine? You know, how can, how can they do that? I think that's a really good question. And another really interesting question from Faith. Thank you, Faith, for sharing this. How can we, when we think about, you know, um, being a team member in this current climate, how can we give credit to the entire team without diminishing our own contribution? You talked earlier about the statistics that show us that women wait a lot longer in general than men to apply for jobs. So how, how can, you know, Faith's got a really great question. How can she support her team members' individual contribution, but their, their desire to sort of acknowledge the team and the broader effort there? Really great, great question, which I know you sort of addressed in part in your book. Yeah, and I'm sorry, remind me the first question again, I started focusing on the second one. <laughs> I know I've, I've, I've thrown a lot at you there. I mean, the first question was around, you know, how can people be supportive to their colleagues who, yeah. who've, who've got kids at, at home and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's as simple as, is um, you know, reaching out to the individual and asking. That's one. Another way would be to go to your shared manager and say, listen, you know, maybe because this colleague might not have even made the manager aware Right. So maybe you could be a bit of an advocate and an ally and say, listen, I think this woman might be struggling. I would love to be able to help her. Um, is there a way that I can can do that? Is there a way that I can sort of job share in this without, um, you know, diminishing her compensation or supporting her in some way? And, and it doesn't have to be another woman asking. Right. So I think it's like, can I take over some of these responsibilities? Can I finish up that project? Can I initiate this new project? on her behalf so that you can, we keep the productivity going, yada, yada. So I think that's, that's part one, that. right? That's yeah. part of that allyship again, isn't it? And, and being conscious. Yeah. Well, and you know, the other thing I think that we forget is a lot of these managers have never operated. This is a, no one has dealt with this environment that we are in as a world, as the planet. And so you've got managers and leaders who have never been through downturns in economic cycles, they've never been through a pandemic, they've never been through a Black Lives Matter. I mean, this is a convergence of things that happens once in a millennium, right? And so don't assume that they have all the answers, they don't. So help them out, 
If you see something, say something. It's it's really kind of that simple. Part two. Of Go the ahead. I love part two. I love this. I'm excited. And and, and this is where the, remind me the person is asking about how can they begin to advocate for themselves better. I'll go back and remind you what I was saying around taking an inventory of your own competencies. And my book is called Career Mapping, Charting Your Course in the New World of Work. And in it, I'm really saying, what have you done really well? Because you amass competencies. They never leave you. And so make sure that you are giving yourself credit for all the things that you're good at. I don't care what context. I don't care what job, what industry, what function. You collect them up. And these are the things that are portable, um, transportable um, kinds of competencies and capabilities. So own that, understand that, and be prepared to talk about that. And so, you know, the other thing is a lot of times we get a job description and we're in the job for three or four years, the job could have morphed completely. We're doing three X, the responsibilities, and no one said anything waiting on you, right? So we need to make sure that what we're doing day to day is lining up with the job description that we're in the pay band for so that there's not, there aren't disparities. Again, we put too much faith in the organization. Having worked in a really large tech company, I can tell you that, you know, there's there's a lot of swirl. There's stuff that just doesn't get tended to and job descriptions and, and things like that tend to be left to the HR folks and the hiring managers and, and other leaders day to day aren't attentive to it. So you need to be and get the allies, whether it's in HR or somewhere else. One last point. Um, I think we don't often feel as though we have the sovereignty, the agency to walk. Not every job is a good job. We didn't come here to suffer. So we deserve to be happy and fulfilled in our work. And there are employers out there like Zendesk who are willing to support you. So be discerning and don't be afraid because people, companies are hiring. So if you're out of work or if you're thinking of making a change, be discriminating and discerning about the company that you go into and make sure that they have some of these policies that are going to support you and ask other women in your network. You've got, you've just broadened your network by a lot with all of us. And so tap in and ask questions to say, you know, who has worked in this organization and, you know, what kind of a, a reputation do they have as an employer? We deserve that. And we don't often use that. Yeah, it's such a good point. It's a really, really good point. And I think that that's so, I I think that that's so important that you've raised that, Ginny. While we're waiting for legislation, while we're waiting for business to catch up, there is a grassroots approach as well um, that we can all take. And it's interesting you said, I mean, that's a big part of the reason why I built the Pep Talker app was for that exact reason. I wanted to support women at the grassroots to be able to track their successes, to build that brag book so that they have the data to advocate for themselves. Colleen, at the Mom Project, I know I think probably a lot of what Ginny said will resonate with you. I know that, you know, you are really focused on partnering with employers like Zendesk um, who value um, the the insight and the knowledge that, that, that these mums are going to bring into the workforce. But it's more than that as well. I want to, I want to ask you the theme this this year for International Women's Day is this concept of choosing to challenge. Um, so what, I mean, how did how does that theme resonate with you this year, Colleen? And what do you kind of make of it? Are you challenging anything this year off the back of that? Well, my kids and husband will tell you I'm challenging something every day. So um, I think at, at the Mom Project, as we've started to push through, you know, 2020 and beyond, what does our business look like? What do our partnerships look like? You know, what we're seeing now being, you know, about five five years into this journey of, of really normalizing caregivers and women winning at work. Um, it's, it's been the commitment from companies like Zendesk from, you know, large commitments like Accenture Midwest, you know, vowing to bring 150 moms into their technology and consulting practice in the Midwest. We're seeing this real tangible impact. And I think what we're choosing to challenge is that um, this isn't possible or that it's uh, COVID is going to set women back. We're seeing labor participation rates likely uh, looking like 1988, which is very scary. We're choosing to challenge that um, we have to settle for that. And I, and I think we all need to be um, activated to, to improve the outcomes for, for women. And we can't allow for there to be, I think the stat I read yesterday was 2.1 million women have vanished from the paid labor force. Um, and so we know they're working at home. They're the backstops for um, the American families, but 
um, we need to be able to let them uh, thrive and flourish in their careers and be able to provide for their families. So we're choosing to challenge anything that that comes our way that that says that can't be possible. Uh, it's such an important message. I appreciate that, Colleen. What about you, Evangeline? Anything that you're choosing to challenge that resonates with you this year? I just want to encourage others, and I'm learning this myself, we need to stop apologizing. I think women in general, you know, we're, we're more apologetic, we are less assertive, and, um, you know, I have my kid running in the background, I have to run to this pickup, and, and really, I think it's, stop apologizing, myself included, and uh, I think that's what I'm choosing in terms of to, to challenge women to like, we can't do it all and that's okay. And, and that's totally okay. And maybe, and, and to the point I think Ginny made earlier, perhaps perhaps an extension of that, if I may, Evangeline, like also choosing to put that out there, the support that you do need and ask for that help or that support if you feel like you're not getting it um, at work. I love that. And the, Feel the empowered. Is, go ahead, beg your pardon, go ahead. I was just gonna add to that. It's just about, you know, uh, feeling empowered. Uh, to ask for what you need. A hundred percent. And, you know, on the apologizing point, I've done this exercise before with a lot of our corporate clients um, and with our, our, our um, professional women who've been through our career level up program as well. Try this. Just try counting how many times you say sorry in a day. A little challenge for you all today. Count how many times you say sorry today. I did it on a girls weekend once and we stopped after about 15 minutes because we were so, we were like, whoa too much we can't keep counting so it's a really great point that evangeline makes it's really um it's important to be conscious of that um ali what about you you're challenging every day in the work that you do with the status quo your book challenges a lot um really excited for the launch of your book as well how do you feel about the theme of choose to challenge this year for international women's day yeah i mean i think for me with the book i I've been told for many years as a pretty open book female founder that's been really candid about my highs and lows and failures and inexperience with management bumps along the way, mistakes we've made, learning opportunities. I've been told by some of our female investors to be less vulnerable and put on a braver face and you know make it all seem perfect and easy lest we scare away other investors or our customers. Um, I, I just feel very passionate about speaking to the underbelly of entrepreneurship, being as candid and vulnerable about it as possible, especially now when so many women have been pushed out of the workforce due to COVID and are now taking on their own businesses and entrepreneurship out of necessity, not out as like a fun side hustle, like we saw a lot many years ago. Um, and so I think for me, my choose to challenge is Let's choose to challenge this notion that women have to be perfect, that women leaders have to present themselves as perfect, because I think it sets them up to fail when they make mistakes. The media loves coming after them. It just creates a very uncomfortable dynamic at work. Um, and I think women need to be more open about the things they don't know, the things that they're learning and, and the, the destination that they want to get to. Um, and so I'm super excited for the book. I'm really hoping that it makes uh, you know, first time entrepreneurs that are coming to entrepreneurship due to COVID feel seen and heard when they are juggling childcare. I interviewed multiple moms for the book about juggling their businesses and juggling ch childcare. Um, I hope it, it makes them feel seen when they feel like they're in an industry that they don't know, but they're really excited about. And they feel like, oh, I should have been an industry veteran for 10 years. That's the founders I'm seeing on the cover of magazines and I'm new to this. So I'm going to fail. Um, and I, yeah, I think my choose to challenge is really just about removing this impression that women have to be perfect. They have to present themselves as perfect. Um, it sets us up to fail. It intimidates other women in, out of becoming leaders and out of entering entrepreneurship because there is such a high bar to meet. So that's that's what I'm all about in 2021. Let's just ditch that and be real and be authentic and talk about the things we don't know, the things we've done wrong, the things we're going to do wrong. And that way we can bring more people into the conversation to get to better solutions rather than feeling like it's all on us and on our shoulders to figure this out and solve a lot of these work issues. 
appreciate you sharing that, Ali. And I can say I follow Ali on Instagram and she really does. She really does live, live those values and, and shares very openly the good, the bad and the ugly um, of the business. And so, which I learn a lot from. So thank you, Ali. And I think we can all learn a lot from choosing to challenge to step into that bravery of being vulnerable. Um, Ginny, I want to leave the last word with you because you've been choosing to challenge a lot of these structural things within big workplaces for a long time and you've learned a lot along the way like what's what are you thinking is the most important thing for us to challenge what's the most important thing that can move the needle do you think on these issues i really think it goes back to what you were saying i think this is a personal journey for us as women um to for us to really step in and fill the void i always just just say that to my team you know it's that they're seeing something that isn't allowing them to do their job the way they want to do it or if there's a gap then fill it do it So I think we as women need to fill that gap, own what we're good at. Um, You know, Ali, I love your vulnerability. We we are, um, we think sometimes we allow ourselves to be put down. I've done it where, you know, we're going to not say something in the meeting. We need to, yes, be vulnerable, but at the same time, we need to be more vocal. Because I, I just want us to remember that those people that we hold in high esteem, those leaders, they don't necessarily know what they're doing either. They just don't. So they need, they're, they're going to appreciate it. If you can say, this is what I need, they are going to appreciate it. And that helps you and all these other women who are coming behind you. Don't forget about that. This isn't just you in the game. So, you know, muster the courage, get your, your support, get your little pitch down, practice it a couple times and go in and say what you want and what you need. That was the best lesson my father told me as a prison warden, he said, tell people what you want. And if you don't, how? don't assume that they're gonna know. So stand up for yourself. And that's gonna help a lot of these other things begin to get traction because now people can, can kind of see and hold them accountable. If you know what the policy is, remind your manager, this is our policy and I'm not seeing that activated. Is there a disconnect here? Should I take this to someone else? You don't have to be threatening. You don't have to be accusatory, but accountability reigns right now. And so does your own um, sense of justice and, and need for support. Oh, I wish we need to make a T-shirt of all of the quotes that you just said, Ginny. So powerful. There's a Murray Claire's done a piece with Stacey Abrams this month. And there's a quote in it that really stuck with me. And she says that, you know, we forget what each one of us can do, the power that each one of us actually has. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes it's easy to think, oh, that's the government's problem, that's the CEO's problem, that's, you know, that's that company's problem. But, like, hang on a minute. I, what I want to challenge all of us today is you actually can make change. Like, you actually have power. Do you have as much power as Joe Biden? Maybe not, but you do have some power. And I think that's really interesting that she reminds us, Stacey Abram reminds us in this article that you actually do have power and all of us have the capacity to start a ripple effect, right? Just a tiny little ripple effect of choosing to have a tough conversation, a courageous conversation at work, in our family life, with our friends. And that conversation, who knows what ripple effect that could go on to have. And I know that it's tough. And I know that it's hard to balance the politics and we've had a lot of questions coming in about that. So happy to continue those conversations on LinkedIn as well. I've popped all the um, panellists' information. Please follow them. They're amazing thought leaders in their space and we're just so grateful that they were all here today to share their um, perspective and we hope that you've all taken something away from today's session. Grateful to Zendesk for having these open conversations and for challenging all of us to think constructively um, and, and to think about what we can all do. Um, and thank you to all of the allies um, who are here today. We, we value you and we appreciate um, your, your role in this, in this conversation as well. Make sure you check out the Mom Projects research. It is awesome. We will send you a link to that and to Ali's book and to Ginny's book in the, in the follow-up roundup. Um, Evangeline, if we, we have some resources that, that she might be sharing as well in that email. So please keep in touch. Zendesk holds some fabulous events. So thank you to everyone internally and externally who's joined us today. Grateful for your time. Have a wonderful rest of the week. Um, my name is Maggie Palmer. It's been a pleasure to host you today and we will see you again at the next session. Thank you so much, everyone.